so we'll let them make their way out. And while they are, if you would please take your Bibles and open to the book of Joshua, chapter number one. Joshua, chapter number one. I enjoy reading the uh, book of Joshua just simply because we watch a, I, I can't say he's actually a young man, but Joshua is an impressive individual. And it's not because he was born into anything unique, it was because of his obedience that allowed him to do some of the things that he did. His, it, I, I, we don't know exactly everywhere that his life began, but we do know one very influential time in his life. As just a very young man, he was chosen uh, to help because when Moses was choosing individuals to go spy out the land of Canaan, because they had been wandering now in the wilderness, and, uh, they, well, excuse me, they were getting ready to wander in the wilderness, I guess I should say. And, uh, and so they had come out of Egypt Joshua had seen all the plagues that had plagued Egypt of that day. Finally, the last plague that God had sent was to kill the firstborn if you did not have the blood applied to the doorposts and lintels of your home. Joshua saw all of those. I don't know if it was he himself or if it was his dad or somebody in his family that that evening before, before nightfall, they had shed the little blood of the of the they shed the blood of the, the lamb as they had been instructed. They had taken the hyssop weed and they had gone up to the doorpost of their house and they had placed it on the doorpost and, and the lintel. The important part is that they did not put it on the on the uh, on the on the threshold there because you don't walk on the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So in that instance, as it was placed there to somewhat form a cross that uh, would be representative of what Jesus would do one day, it was applied. Joshua saw all those things. He saw the frogs, the flies, the, the cattle, the, the blights, everything that had gone on, the darkness. He had seen all of those things. He had seen the mighty power and mighty hand of God. He was able in some manner or another to get close enough to Moses that was walked up to the mightiest man of that day, familiar place because he was reared in that very palace that he walked into. And as he walked up or walked into the throne room there where Pharaoh was sitting, I'm sure that he looked around and he remembered because they were familiar to him. Because as a child, as the governmental decree had come through that any child, any Hebrew child was to, that was born, if it was male, it was to be killed. Of course, Moses' mother did not obey that, neither did the midwives of that day, and Moses was born. Scripture says he was a goodly child. In that instance, it finally came to a point where his mother could not hide him anymore and had to put him in the little, in the, in the little uh, ark that was there and pushed him out into the river. Well, it just so happened that Pharaoh's daughter, the princess now, had come down to the, the bank to, to bathe and things with her attendants. As she was down there, they happened to notice something was over in the bulrushes, and she instructed her attendants to go and, and bring the little, that little ark over to her. The very second that she opened it, of course, the baby whimpered and cried, and her heart was broken. She recognized it was one of the little Hebrew children and, uh, and said, I'm, I can't let him be annihilated as, the, as whether it was her father or whomever that had made the decree, said, I can't let him be destroyed. And so she took him back to the palace. Interesting thing is Moses' sister was watching on the bank to watch what was going on. And she overheard Pharaoh's daughter say, uh, I, I need somebody to care for this child because I, I, I need somebody to help nanny or take care of him. And Miriam on the bank said, I know somebody that can take care of him. Ran home and got his mother. Now God... Hey, do you not see how God can work through the things that you and I cannot see? Now Moses' mother did not have to face his annihilation, but now was going to be paid by Pharaoh to take care of her own child. And in that instance, he was reared in some of the best education and some of the best hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat, some of the most amazing things. So now as he is much older, walking into Pharaoh's palace, he recognizes the area 
But Joshua recognizes something else. He says, there's something about that man that's different. He walked right up to Pharaoh and said, let my people go. And in that instance, Joshua's heart was beginning to be knit towards the man of God. As they finally came to the brink of, and finally Pharaoh, because of the last plague that was there, told the children of Israel, just go on, just go. And they did leave. Of course, uh, he changed his mind and had the uh, army chase after them. And eventually they came to the brink of the Red Sea. And Moses basically said, what are we going to do? And uh, (laughs) God said, I think it's kind of interesting. What are you going to do? You know, isn't it kind of sometimes we get to a point where we say, God, we don't know what to do. And he just kind of waits to see, well, let's see what you do. The wise individual says, God, I'll do whatever you tell me to do. You just tell me and I'll do it. I don't want to, I, I don't want to use my own understanding. I don't want to use my own scheming. I don't want to use anything like that. I want your will. And at that point, God had instructed Moses what to do. He said, uh, basically, you come up to the, the brink of the river. He said, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to cause a great wind to come and part the sea. And he said, it'll, it'll be to a point where the, the waters will be up on each side, and I'll dry out the ground so you can go right through. And that's exactly what he did. He and those close to, the estimation is, close to a million individuals walked through on dry ground. And in that instance, you say, well, it, it was just not very deep water. And so, uh, you know, they could have just kind of tromped through there just a little bit. But uh, anytime uh, scripture says it is a sea, rest assured, it's deep enough to, <laughs> it's going to be over your head. We always toy around and play with it quite a bit. I won't necessarily this morning. But uh, in that instance, no, I got to, it's too funny. It just really is. The old, uh, there, there was an old preacher and he was preaching about the whole thing. He said, I, 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 I heard the theologians say that the children of Israel did not go through the Red Sea. They went through the Reed Sea, just a small body of water. And they, they tromped through on ankle deep water. He said, but it's just a great miracle. Because God done went and drowned at all of Pharaoh's army in that ankle deep water. <laughs> no, when Moses went through. Pharaoh's army began to go through, and all of a sudden, God caused the waters to close. (laughs) You get to go and visit the aquarium and see all the fish. The children of Israel walk through with no glass whatsoever and are looking at the different fish that are there and say, Mom, look at that, look at that. And I can imagine she said, Don't touch it, don't touch it. I don't want anything to change. You don't touch anything. In that instance, Joshua walked through that dry ground. He got to the other side. They finally came to a little place called Kadesh Barnea. Moses looked out to the the elite individuals of that day, those people that would come from the 12 tribes of Israel, and he chose two individuals. He chose 12 total because they were all going to go out and spy the land of Canaan to see where they should go in. That was the initial decree. You go and find out the best place to go in. There was no question because that was the promised land. That was the land they were going back to. God had already given it to them. That was the instruction. Understanding that fear began to grip them when they saw the walled cities. They saw the things that were there and they saw the weapons of war and they saw the warriors and they even saw that family that Goliath came from, Anak. And they said, there are giants in the land. These people that were, and scripture gives us very clear that the, they were sometimes nine foot tall. When we see someone that's over seven or you know up to seven foot tall and things like that, we see, man, he is he is huge. But could you imagine two more feet and not a skinny rail, but somebody that's huge warrior? And they came back, and Tin said, "We can't go in. We can't do it." And in that instance, two individuals, Joshua and Caleb, said, "We are well able." It's not us, but it's God. Joshua had seen what Moses could do, and he wasn't wasn't impressed necessarily with Moses, but he was impressed with the God of Moses. And he said, and I want to know that God. And he began to say, "I, I want to see more about him and what more he can do. Joshua said, look, we let's go. And finally the ten overruled them and said, No, we can't go in. 
So God made them wander in the wilderness for 40 years until everyone at that point that was over the age of 20 passed away. I've thought about it before. <laughs> How would you have liked to have been the last one? You'd pillow your head at night with one eye open and say, man, because when I die, they get to go into the promised land. I wonder how long I'm going to make. Could you imagine they thinking, yeah, Uncle Herb, is, is for, as soon as he passed away, we're going in the promised land. That's getting a, <laughs> Aunt Myrtle, could you do something about him? Could you? <laughs> but in that instance, there came a point where finally it was time to go into the promised land. Moses, because of his disobedience, was not going to be able to lead them into the promised land. God had chosen that individual, Joshua, that had stood there for, and by the way, there was only two people that were over the age of 20 that got to go into the promised land of that day, if you want to put it like that, that were 20 years old or, or older when they first came to Kadesh Barnea, and that was Joshua and Caleb. They had now wandered in the wilderness, because so could you imagine now that they are at least 60 years old, and I imagine a little older. And in that, il in that instance, they were getting ready to go in now. We come to Joshua chapter number one. And I want you to take note of something if we could, because God is still very instrumental in what he is going to do. And he is still very able. And by the way, he is still able for you and I today. It doesn't matter what you're facing or what you're getting ready to face. It doesn't matter what's going to come in the future. God is still able to take care of those things. He just needs somebody that will stand up and believe that he is able to do what needs to be and not, be, not hunker down because of fear. And uh, fear is a destroyer. It will keep you from doing those things that uh, it will cause you anxieties and everything else. But there is still a God that can do miraculous and tremendous things in the heart and life of his people. And he's looking for somebody to use. I want you to notice, if you would, please, if you found the book of Joshua, chapter number one, we're going to read verses one through eight this morning. And so if you found that, Joshua chapter number one, verses one through eight, let's all stand for the reading of God's word. I'll read the first verse if you'll join me on the next, and we'll read down through verse number eight this morning. Beginning in verse number one, the Bible says, Now, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of a good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law, which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not, uh, turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then shalt thou make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. I want you to notice this little phrase that is there. That last verse that we just read, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. Notice those next two words. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. There's a contingency here. He made it very clear, so I want to talk to you about that, those two little words. For then. For then. Father, I do ask that you'd please help us now to recognize the importance of thy word, to see that if you've said it, that settles it. God, I do ask that you'd please help us today. 
to see how that your word can accomplish great things in the hearts and lives of your people today. Help us now, please, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Joshua saw all the things that Moses had done. He had heard the voice of Moses many times, even when others said, <clears throat> Moses, you go talk to God. We'll, we'll stay here. They had even put a, a tent outside of the camp to one, at one point, and Moses would go out there and meet with God. The thing that Moses was wanting the children of Israel to do is to understand the God that he was serving, the God that was leading them, and the God that was supplying their needs was their God. He was a personal God, and he wanted them to have a relationship with him also. And he is interested in that very same relationship for you, with you today. Because you see, he uniquely puts you together because there is something about you that not another single person in the entire world has that God would desire to have. And you're the only one that can supply that need. I, I know that uh, we look at it and say, well, there's nothing unique about me. Oh, contraire. To God, you are supremely unique and there is no, not another like you whatsoever. It doesn't matter. You say, well, I've got a twin. That doesn't matter whatsoever. God made you an individual uniquely different from the person that may look like you and may have a number of genetics that are like you, but there's nothing, there is no one like you. And God knows that. And there's something. I used to, I used to laugh at my, my mother all the time because she enjoyed singing. She used to describe her singing as a foghorn going off in the, in the middle of the night. And I said, oh, Mom, it's not that bad. And uh, she said, oh, son, I sound like an old foghorn. But you know what? That was a foghorn that God enjoyed hearing. And no matter who you are or no matter what you've, what you've been through or all the other things, God loves to hear you. He loves to hear the tone of your voice. He loves to how you form the words that you put together. He enjoys having your presence come to the throne room of grace. I can't, there's no way for me to adequately describe how much God loves you. You say, well, God loves the whole world. No, he loves, the reason why this world exists is because of you. Because one day he's going to get rid of this world and make a brand new one. That's why it's so frustrating to me when we say, oh, we've got to save the planet. We're, there's too much carbon. There's too much. God made this world to sustain you and I. And when he came to Moses, he said, or excuse me, he came to, he came to Adam and he said, fill it up. You say, well, there, there's too many population. We're going to use up all the natural resources. Don't you even try. I dare you to try to use all the resources. God will turn water into whatever he needs to turn it into. I, we, we limit God way too much. And we're looking, and by the way, that's called a distraction that Satan sends your direction to get your focus off of he who can supply all your needs into thinking it's limited. And God says, I have no limits. I am boundless. I have no boundaries. I have nothing but endless supply of anything you need. And when we come to him and we say, God, you know, we're using all of our resources, he says, I hate to tell him, he looks over, I'm sure he looks over at Gabriel and says, are they really that dumb? And Gabriel says, yep, they are, they're that dumb. He says, God, they've, they've been around a long time. They've not smartened up a great deal. They really haven't. He scratches his head, he says, I can, <laughs> I, I, I let Jesus turn water into wine, turn it into the grape juice that's there. Don't they think I can do something? I turned water into blood for one of the, the things. Don't they know that I can do about anything I need to do? They just don't believe it. God can make the sun stand still. He can do whatever's necessary. By the way, he can do whatever's necessary for you also. But there's a few things that for you and I that we're going to have to realize if we're going to have the kind of faith that is necessary to realize that God can do miraculous things for you. Now, you say, well, I'm not worthy. Not a single one of us are. You can just go ahead and put that in the, in the column that says this doesn't matter. That is the, the don't matter column. Now, I'm not saying you should, try to, uh, you should try to do things just to keep God from blessing you because you can withhold the blessing of God if you so choose. But he has given us the wherewithal to be able to have the opportunity to see his will, to do his work, and to receive his presence and thereby the blessings that come along with it. Because I want you to notice as he was giving instructions 
instruction to Joshua. He says, this, this million people that you're going to take into the promised land. Now, had they, had they fought any big battles like they were going to fight? They had fought some skirmishes before. But God had already made it very clear. I'm going to fight your battles. You don't have to necessarily do a thing except to do what I ask you to do. He said, so I'm going to give that to you. And the truth is, the interesting thing about it is, when we read here this book of the law, it is going to be the very book that Moses had written. Because Moses gave us the first five books of the New Testament called the Pentateuch, those first five books. It's interesting because he was educated in Pharaoh's court so he could write God's word. And in that instance, we see here that he comes to Joshua and he says, there's a couple things. He says, I, I know you're a little bit scared. And that's why he tells him in verse number seven, only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe. Notice those next two words, to do. He says, I don't want you just to believe what I've told you. I want you to do what I've told you. He said, because it doesn't do anyone any good to just believe something if it's not going to move you to action. And by the way, you only truly believe what moves you to action. If you honestly believe that prayer changed things, you'd drop to your knees and humble surrender sometimes and pray for things instead of trying to scheme and figure it out yourself. God will give you direction, God will give you understanding, and he'll give you the pathway because he leads in a path of righteousness. It's just we want our way, and God says, no, I want you to follow the path of righteousness' sake. And we sometimes choose our way, and we find out how frustrating it is and how difficult, and then we get mad because, God, you didn't help me. He says, I tried to. You just took the path that you wanted instead of the path that I had chosen and set up for you. I know we say, well, how do we find that path? I'm glad you asked. There's two methods, and it's just as simple as it can be. Number one, you've got to ask, and number two, you've got to read. Amen. You say, it, that's too simple. God had to make it simple because we're not that bright. He has seen mankind all through the ages and even though there's some very influential and he's given great uh, insight into a number of people and we could even look at some of the scientists of today and think they're brilliant. All they're doing is find out what God already knows Amen. and they're barely scratching the surface at that. Right. It's like, well, did you know that Einstein, uh, Einstein was a brilliant man, no doubt about it. But he had some ideas about light and different things about time. God says, that's hilarious. He says, let, let, me, let me just pull back the curtain slightly so you can see just a small amount of what I live with all the time. You understand God has no time. God is eternal. That means there is never a point where God isn't, never a point that God will not be. And you say, I can't understand. I know, you and I have to have a beginning and an end. God has no beginning. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and end. And he is before all of those things. Do you understand that God gave us time so that everything doesn't happen at once? Oh, okay, go ahead and stew on that for a little while. But I want you to notice that God made it very clear. He said, this is what I want you to do. In verse number 8 it says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. So that means it's something that we need to talk about, we need to speak about. It's not something that is just done in recluse only. It is not something to be done just in simple devotions. That is, a, that is a fine thing, and you should. But the truth is, it needs to be something that is spoken about on a regular occasion. Because it is something that needs to be spoken about. Find ways to do it. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe, there it is again, to do according to all that is written therein. For then. A few things that I want to give you this morning, if we, if we could, just to settle up with that and then. What will that bring to you when you begin to read scripture, when you begin to meditate on his word? By the way, meditation means that there's going to be a, sm a small portion of it where memorization comes into play. The ladies that are memorizing this are obeying exactly what God has instructed. It does us well to memorize scripture. And, uh, and don't let the last time you memorized the scripture be that one you memorized in Sunday school class, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's a tremendous verse, wonderful verse. It, it gives the, the complete gospel in a nutshell. And that's better than nothing. But believe me, God has given you over 800,000 words that you can memorize here. And by the way, you and I will be judged according to what is in this book when we get to heaven someday. 
Because there will not be one single person that will be able to stand there and say, I didn't know. And God's going to say, I gave you my word. I know we, there's all kinds of rationales we can give to it, but there is, there is no excuse. God has provided his word. He's made it clear to us. Amen. So in that instance, we see here, and then, for then. What is that? Number one, it gives us the knowledge of what God wants. When we begin to take in that book of the law, it is going to give us some clarity on the knowledge of what God wants. I think we get frustrated sometimes because we believe that I don't know what God wants. Have you read what God has already instructed us? Have you read what God already wants from Scripture? It's like, well, that's what he wanted for them. Do you understand that what God does through the person of the Holy Spirit is he gives you insight and understanding from his word? There have been people that have come up to me and they have written me notes. I'll preach on one subject and they come up to me after the sermon and say, boy, I tell you what, the Lord made it so very clear to me about this. And I'm thinking, I didn't say a word about that. They've written letters and say, thank you so much for that message. It meant so much because of this. And I'm thinking, I didn't say a thing about that. But what happens is the Holy Spirit is the one that gives understanding, clarity, and insight into his word. And in that instance, we see and then. We want the and then. We want the things that are going to come. We want the product that's going to come. We have seen the product that has come. We have seen God's presence. We have seen others that have been involved with that. We have heard testimony of those things. We believe it. The only problem is we don't want to put the recipe together to get the outcome over here. We want to try to do it our way. And God says, your way is not going to get the and then result. And so we begin to try our way and find out it's faulty and it fails and it, it comes up incomplete. And God says, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. When we choose to set aside, it, I'm not opposed to the, the uh, devotional books. They can be a great asset to help you give us some clarity. But when it all boils down, you and I have got to take in the word of God in some manner or another. Whether it's to be read, whether we can sit down and read it, I find myself even these days. I, I get up here to start reading and I wonder sometimes, where did all those words go? You know, I've got these little things on the bottom of my glass that are supposed to be bifocals and, and I have to keep doing this and it's like, uh-oh, he's having those tremors again. It's like, no, I'm, I'm trying to find that little spot on my glasses where it lets me read. It's so much easier just to pull them off and say, oh, there it is. But whether you can read it and say, well, my eyesight's not what it used to be, then listen to it in some manner or another. There, there used to be, I had, uh, I had tapes of Alexander Scorby that was reading the New Testament, and I finally wore out those cassette tapes. <laughs> oh, some of you kids are looking at me like, oh, what? <laughs> cassette tape, believe it or not. And so it's like, I don't have any idea what that is. And, but these days, I, I, on my phone, I have a, an app. Oh, now they're with me again. Now they're <laughs> I have an app that lets me listen to the, uh, the, the Bible on that. And so I put my earphones in and uh, my little earbuds and I turn on the, the little audible thing and, uh, and he begins to read. Well, when he's reading too slow, I can speed him up with just the moving of my thumb like that. And it's kind of interesting because he, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate. It's like, oh no, we got, we got to speed up here. And so I just move him up. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. Then I, I can get through a lot quite a bit. And then when he says something that catches my attention, I hit the pause button. And, uh, and I may make a note so I can go back and look at it and read it. Now, my favorite is to sit down with my Bible and to look at those words, to feel those pages, and to see those things. Until God takes my eyesight, until, uh, until that day, I look forward to being able to read his word. You see, the knowledge of what God wants is in these pages right here. He lets you find out about his character. And then you will find out the knowledge that God wants you to have about what God wants. Not only that, but number two. And then, and then you will have a promise of his presence and protection. And then you will have a promise of his presence his presence and protection notice if you would please in verse number five the bible makes it very clear as he is giving it to joshua he says there shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life that's a pretty big statement Amen. it doesn't matter who it is when god says there won't be any man he said i've seen kings rise to the greatest the greatest uh, zenith of, of their existence he said i've watched them fall 
I've watched mighty men as they have conquered and as they have obtained. He says, but I've watched them all fail and pass away. But the King of kings and Lord of lords that still sits on the throne today, he is never going to wane in power. He never will. And if he says there won't be any man, I've watched that have made great, there have been, we could mention name after name that have been great leaders. We have heard of great men that have done very renowned things. But the truth is every last one of them has eventually passed. God never has, but he makes it very clear. Where do you want in your standing? You take in the, the books of the law. He says, if you don't let this law pass out of your mind, your mouth, and in that manner is going to then do what is instructed you to do, he says, there won't be a man able to stand before you all the days of your life. I don't care how big they are. I don't care how impressive. I don't care how influential. I don't care how rich. It doesn't matter who they are. They'll not stand. Now, that's impressive, isn't it? There's a confidence that comes, and I hope it's not an arrogancy, but men don't scare me a great deal. Could they, could they, could they beat me like a red-headed stepchild? You know they could. And that's one of those things where, look, I've, I've had a good group of Girl Scouts scare me at times, and so, but, uh, like, I know that I'm not so powerful that I could stand before them and say, but when it all boils down, there is a God in heaven, and there are very few men that scare me. Could they harm me? Yes, I know that. Do I try to take measures to protect myself and my family? Sure I do. But at the same token, when it all boils down, there is still a God that I can, in, that I can turn to, that I've talked to on many occasions, and he has made it very clear. You do what I've instructed you in this book. He said, they'll not stand. He said, they may hurt because that can happen. They may make sure that you fight, and you may as, even at Joshua, he fell on his face one time because at uh, just a few pages over, we'll not turn to it, but he sent some men up to Ai after Jericho. And Ai, because there is sin in the camp, Ai put the children of Israel to flight and killed some of them. Joshua fell on his face and said, Lord, what's happened? He said, I told you that you obey to do according to all that I instructed, and that didn't happen. So this is what happens when you don't do what I've instructed you. Because God came to him and said, get up. He said, you know, stop praying, stop talking. That's not the issue. There's sin in the camp. You've not done what I've instructed you to do. And so they begin to look. And finally they found Achan. And Achan had stolen what God had instructed them, don't take. He said, Jericho is mine. That's the first fruits. He says, I'm going to give you the battle. He said, but you take nothing from them. Nothing. Do you understand me? Most everybody, out of all of the fighting men of that day, they understood, yes, sir. But there was the one, Achan, that decided that he was going to take. And he did. And God allowed those very things, and then the difficulties began to fall. A knowledge of what God wants. A promise of his presence and protection. Not only that, he has promised strong and courageous leadership in verse number 6. He says, be strong and of a good courage, for unto this people shall thou divide for an inheritance the land. So as he has already said that I'm going to give you insight and clarity on who is going to be leading in these lands. But do you understand, and I, we, we've taken a little extra time today, and so I'm going to close here. But I want you to understand, if you and I want the and then, there are some things that you and I are going to have to do, and it's going to revolve around this book. This book is going to have to be something that is made a very, it's going to have to be a major part of our life. It's going to have to be a major part of our day. It's going to have to be a major part of our thought processes, uh, what we do, what we talk about, and how. And I'm not saying just walk around constantly talking about Scripture. I'm not necessarily talking about that. But it's just like the, uh, <laughs> just like the other day. Uh, I'd gone into the, last, last week was doctor's appointments all week long. Monday, I had to go to the doctor because Friday, they took blood out of my arm. Don't like it, but this, the gal that did it did an excellent job. Couldn't even tell what she was doing. I almost looked over to make sure she was doing something, but I didn't. I didn't because that may have changed everything. And so uh, that Monday, I went to the doctor, and uh, he, he comes in there, and he pulls up a little chart. He said, man, I don't know what you're doing. He said, but just keep it up. He said, this is perfect. He said, everything is, is perfect where it needs to be. And I said, praise the Lord. And he kind of looks at me. 
because it's like, oh, that's it, you know, that's the first thing that I think of. Praise the Lord. And uh, so in that instance, there's times that things just, if you put it in, that's what comes out. And so in that instance, this book of the law, don't let it depart out of your heart. But take it in and meditate day and night that thou mayest observe to do all that is according therein. God will give you a knowledge of what he wants. He gives you a promise of his presence and protection. He will give you strong and courageous leadership in that manner. There's others that I have that give some definition from these verses. But understand this. This book has got to be a major part of your life and mine. God gave it to us for a reason. And that reason is so that we would understand who he is, what he does, and how he operates. And he is a good God. He loves you. And in that instance, he wants you. That's how you're going to find out who he is, what he does. And you'll draw a whole lot closer to him. What a tremendous thing. As simple as it is, a book that God has given to us. That's the way you get the and then. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Father, thank you again for the opportunity to be in your house today. Thank you again for your gracious kindness and your presence. God, I do ask that you'd please just use now us to accomplish the things that you would have us to do. God, help us to do your will, to follow accordingly. And Father, I do ask that you'd please just help. A lot of us stay extremely busy during a week's time, and time is a very precious commodity, and we don't know how much we have until your return. We don't know how much we have until uh, you call us home in one manner or another. But God, whatever it is, I do ask that you'd please help us to do those things according to thy will. Please bless our church, and I thank you for it. With our heads bowed and with our eyes closed, the question this morning is this. Do you know for sure that you're on your way to heaven? If you have never trusted Christ as Savior, I'd love to take a Bible and show you exactly what it means to know for sure that you're going to heaven. You don't have to leave today wondering. You don't have to leave today just hoping. If somebody was to ask you today, do you know for sure that you're on your way to heaven? Would your answer only be, well, I hope so? My answer is definitively, without a doubt, I know absolutely I am, according to what God has said. He's made it very clear in 1 John, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. And in that instant, by the way, it's not a feeling. Those may come, but that's not a feeling. But he does give us the opportunity to know for sure that we're on our way to heaven. I'd love to be able to take a Bible and show you exactly what that is. It's not joining this church. It's not getting baptized. It is doing what God has instructed, and it's in Scripture, and it's something that all of us can do. But then, maybe you and I have come to a point where it's like, yes, I've trusted Christ as Savior. I know that. But I so much want the and then. I want the things that God has prepared. I want the things that God knows that I need. I want the things that God would know that's best for me and my family, my future, and my loved ones. I want the end then. Maybe it's time that you say, I need to just have a revival of reading my Bible on a regular basis. Even if it's a few passages a day, I'm going to make it a point that I take in Scripture in some manner every single day. Child of God's got to do it. That's the only way the and then is going to show up. But he encourages you and I to do that. In just a second, we're going to stand with our heads bowed and with our eyes closed. If you've never trusted Christ as Savior, if you'll walk down this aisle when others begin to move, I'll take a Bible. I'll have somebody take a Bible and show you exactly what it means to trust Christ as Savior. Maybe you say, Brother Whitworth, I just need to have a better and a closer relationship with the Word of God. I need to not go a day without it. I need to take something in from it. Christian radio is fine, but I need the Bible. Devotionals are fine, but I need the Bible. All the encouragement is fine, but I need Scripture. And I'm going to dedicate today doing that very thing. Maybe you need to do business with God in whatever manner it is. Let's all stand with our heads bowed, with our eyes closed as the instruments begin to play. If God's spoken to your heart this morning, the altar's open. You may come.